What's going on, my mother lovers? This is the Worst Cat with another episode of DM Worst Cat's World. I just did a 50-minute video with no sound. <laughs> so, um, it's fine. It's nice to be finally talking to you all. Um, we're going to be talking today about the best thing that 5th edition did for Dungeons & Dragons. And that is to make Tabaxi a playable PC character race. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, he, he's talking about furries. No, I'm not. I'm not talking about furries, okay? Uh, and don't shit on my 80s cartoons either, okay? We, we, we did that whole thing, right? Like the Rescue Rangers and Biker Mice from Mars and shit. We did that before furry was a thing. Um, and I'll show you how far back to Baxi go. They're safe. They're safe, right? Like, like Crystal Fox from Star Fox. Um, but I wanted to talk to all the people out there in 5th edition that are looking to bring Tabaxi back to like a 2nd edition or 1st edition game because, spoiler alert, there are no rules for playing a Tabaxi PC character um, in 2nd or 1st edition. And you really can't take the 5th the edition representation of what Tabaxi are and then just plop them in. Uh, it, it, will, it will go bad, if you will. Particularly if you're a DM. Um, so I wanted to give everybody a good primer on where Tabaxi came from, what they, you know, where, where, where did D&D first see Tabaxi? How did they look in 2nd edition? And why they are, con why I would consider them to be a great addition to a second edition game. So let's start at the beginning. The first time we see Tabaxi in Advanced Dungeons and Dragons is in first edition, the Fiend Folio Bro. So in August of 1979. August 1979, we have the Fiend Folio hit the shelves, and that was the first place where we see Tabaxi, and I'll throw it up on the screen here for you. They only had half a page dedicated to them, and they were a generic cat, person, race, species, whatever. Um, consequently, coincident with this timeline, you had uh, Cantrosians, right? The, uh, they were featured in some Star Wars um, some Star Wars comics and then what are, is it Katians that were uh, Katians in Star Trek right so this whole concept this uh, cosmology of a cat person um, has been around for a while and in Dungeons and Dragons it's been around for a really long while um, so I think that it, it's a natural inclusion as we look at 2nd edition and then people moving from 5th edition into 2nd edition or 1st edition have have something to go on when they still want to play their uh, tabaxi character. Um, so, looking at where we go next, this is the Fires of Zatal adventure for levels 1 to 3. This is, as you can see, it's Forgotten Realms. Um, this is really the definitive source of information for what a tabaxi is in second edition uh this is so the uh, fiend folio was campaign agnostic there was the, the, that was just a a grouping of monsters that you could use wherever you would use them this is the publication that decided that tabaxi are going to be in the forgotten realms uh more specifically the um sub setting of Mastica, which I'll show you right now. Nice little nice box set, right? Nice box set, Mastica. And and think about Mastica as like um as as like ancient Aztec, right? So you could have like a whole campaign with cool ancient Aztec flavorings, um, you know, clans and, and more tribal humans and stuff like that. It's pretty awesome. But, like I say, Fires of Zatal, this adventure, is where Tabaxi landed, um, and I'll throw it up on screen right there. So, that is kind of the springboard for where we enter Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 2nd Edition 
with Tabaxi uh, and what their abilities are. Now, between first edition and second edition, there were definitely some changes, um, and you know you can you can look those up if if it interests you. We're really only talking about the second edition version, um, but suffice to say, second edition gives a really good representation of where we can go with player characters. Now, um, there that's not the only place Tabaxi are mentioned in. AD&D. They are also mentioned in Volo's Guide to the Daylands. So, apparently, there's this place, there's a city called Abashinford. And it's right in the middle of the Daylands, right, in Mistendale. Right in the middle of Mistendale is Abashinford. And that place is like the Woodstock or the Las Vegas Strip of the Daylands. Specifically in summer. It's like where all of the Dales converge to have their like summer festivities and like, again, Woodstock. Um, and apparently there is a multi-story brothel by the name of the Velvet Vale. Um, it doesn't really call it a brothel, but the Velvet Vale features some like thunder down under scantily clad male dancer situation for like all the chicks and they obviously have the super racy super sexualized dancer situation for all the dudes um and they have escorts and they operate dancers as escorts and they have rooms that you can enjoy the escorting scene in, right? So what else would you call that? Uh, a, a fest hall, right. So um, apparently there is a... Why, why do we go there? There is a tabaxi dancer that is so skilled with her craft that she makes every man sweat from the brow that watches her performance. Um... And, and that is in Volo's Guide to the Dale Lands. You can check me out if you want. Uh, where is it? Oh, here we go. Uh, bam, here we go. Um, but yeah, so Tabaxi definitely have a place in the Forgotten Realms. And in, um, in modern, I would say in polite culture, in, in popular culture, whatever. Um, the reason I bring that up is because... Uh, Almost, well, probably a lot of you, maybe not all of you, a lot of you have looked at the Monstrous Manual, and you've probably turned to the entry for Tabaxi and read a somewhat disturbing thing. And that simply is, Tabaxi are hunted for their pelts, which are worth up to 250 gold pieces each. Their skins and claws are also useful in some types of natural magic. I can only imagine um, many a uh, enterprising player that has turned to our Tabaxi entry and said, "You know what? I would like to play one of those things or something like it." Right, cat person. Right. I mean, it's kind of a recurring theme. I think we've established at this point, um, but. I can imagine a lot of dungeon masters going, wait a minute, they're hunted for their claws and their pelt. No, no, we're not doing that. Uh, I'm not going to play out you going into every town and, you know, some dude with a cocked hat and a heavy crossbow trying to bag you, like, every single time. That's just, no, that's not my idea of fun. Well, I'm glad I went back to the original reference, which is the Fires of Zatal adventure uh, that I first showed you. Tabaxi were hunted for their pelts and claws on the island of Nexal by the tribal humans that live there. Okay, That's where that comes from. So once we get into Faerun, right, the main continent um, of the Forgotten Realms, that's not a thing anymore. Right, so, uh, and and that is supported, I believe, by the Volo in or, or the entry in Volo's Guide to the Dale Lands, which tells us that you know not only in like the Dale Lands, which is like the most you know uh, milk toast, 
you know, common universal representation of all things medieval slash, um, you know, I would say normal, but it's like a typical medieval, you know, cottagey sort of setting. We have a tabaxi exotic dancer, right? And you wouldn't, you wouldn't see that if people were looking to skin this thing alive and rip its claws off, right? So, um, that cleared up some things for me personally, uh, looking at it through the eyes of a dungeon master, like, whoa, like, so f not only does, uh, the Faerun culture, like there is room for them, so to speak, um, they they actually are fairly well integrated and that actually goes further. In the Fires of Zatal Adventure, we learn that the nation of An is actually colonizing the island of Nexal, which is where these tabaxi are from. So, it stands to reason that the slave trade and indentured servanthood are how tabaxi got back to the mainland realms um, from uh, uh, Amish slavers and merchants and things like that. So... If you look at where Omn is on the map of the Forgotten Realms, and then you look at all the way up the Sword Coast, and all the way over to the Dale Lands, uh, into the Heartland of the Realms, like that is one hell of a long distance, right? And you would need a supply chain that got you from point A to point B. So the reason why I bring that up is that this that level of commerce has already been established to get a... Uh, 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 ostensibly young and beautiful tabaxi dancer chick out there doing her thing. Um, so that's just another reason that I saw, like, oh, wow, like, no, these, there actually is definitely validity and viability to incorporating tabaxi as a playable race inside the campaign setting. So where do we go from here? Well, I'm going to throw up some... Um, oh, oh, God. <laughs> um, wow. <laughs> we, we just got visited, bros. We got, we got visited by the old boy. Oh, my God. Oh, man. So, I'm going to throw up the, uh, the modifiers that I've come up with. And uh, I'll, I'll let you take a look at that while I'm messing with, messing with my little dude here. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Okay, that's enough. Come on now. He's gonna you're gonna hog the you're gonna hog the whole turn. Ugh. There you go. Ugh. All right. So what I'm looking at is a well, like I say, it's up on the screen, plus two to dex, minus one to wisdom, minus one to intelligence. The reason why we're looking at minusing to wisdom and intelligence, uh, it should be fairly self explanatory, but looking into the entries of the fires of Zatal adventure at the entry for tabaxi we see that their intelligence is average to intelligent to highly intelligent right and those scores have a uh, usual range of 8 to 14 um, so having a racial maximum of around the 17 mark felt okay to me and if you look at morale, so morale is a indirect representation of the charisma score. Um, their morale is steady, 11 to 12. Now, that is actually higher than average, right? So it wouldn't make sense for them to take a hit on charisma. But um, wisdom, particularly in, you know, outside of their, their native uh, territory and domain, it just, it, it made sense to me as well there. Now, one of the things that Fires of Zatal did was expand the concept of tabaxi to include the tabaxi lord, or in this case, jaguar lord. Imagine, if you will, for a moment, a displacer beast without the tentacles, but with all the evil and its own, you know, a, a unique and special variant of spells and spell-like abilities that they get to claim, that is a Jaguar Lord. Um, they are a very important part of Tabaxi culture because one of the things you'll read, even in our monstrous manual here, 
even in the Monstrous Manual, you'll read that Tabaxi worship a deity called Zaltek. Zaltek is the guy that you sacrifice 10,000 of your warriors to so that he can win a battle against another god. Uh, human sacrifice, war, bloodshed. The, the, the most violent aspects of like an ancient Aztec culture, that's Zaltec. And Tabaxi, or Jaguar Lords, when they take over a Tabaxi clan, almost all the time, they force the entire clan to worship Zaltec. Um, so it's kind of a big deal. <laughs> uh, they're kind of a big deal. And they are strong enough to take over a Tabaxi clan. Now, so what kind of modifiers should that entail? Well, I have a twist on that. So I'll throw them here. You know, they were up on the board. They're going to be up here again, uh, up on the screen. So I have a plus one dex, plus one strength, plus one intelligence, but minus one to wisdom, minus two to charisma. Now, they need to be physically dominant, and I think I'm achieving that with the plus one to dex and plus one to strength. <clears throat> However, when it comes to intelligence, Jaguar Lords are high to genius level intelligence. The average scores being 13 to 18. That's insane. Um, so that's why we see that plus one intelligence, and that's why. Hey, wait, wait, what? Intelligence? Where does that come in, right? So that's where that. That's why that's there. Now their morale score is average, eight to ten. So um, they actually. That's where the penalty to their charisma comes in. Not to mention the fact that they are very evil and love sacrificing humans and other tabaxi. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that kind of puts a damper on the whole charisma business, you know what I'm saying? But, um, so that's where the attribute modifiers come in for me as a DM. Side note, if you are coming from 5th or 4th or whatever, 3rd, 3.5, um, and you're looking at a 2nd or 5th, And we're back. Oh my god. <laughs> 50 minutes, no audio. <laughs> I'm so sorry. All right, so we're back. Um, wow, that just, yeah, I totally forgot where I was at. So, negative two to charisma. Um, oh, so if you are coming from some of those later editions and you're going back to second or first edition, you're probably not used to the stat modifiers equaling zero right in the middle. So if you have a bonus to something, you need to have a drawback to something and that race's attribute scores need to average out to zero. And that's true with every single one, even the bone stock races that are in the player's handbook. Right. Um, and that's why the spread, um, is as you see it now if you have a player and they are pitching a character race or a concept or something like that and the attribute modifiers do not equal zero that is a red flag uh, to you as a dungeon master especially or if you're another player um, that's a red flag because most likely that idea is just it's overpowered with this the second edition system right so that's just something to keep in mind now so those are our stat bonuses, and you can see the, the racial bonuses listed below. Most of these racial bonuses come from the Fires of Zatal or the uh, Monstrous Manual, right? And again, going back to uh, going back to having a, a player character as a Tabaxi, you don't want to uh, you don't you don't want to make a Tabaxi but not have it be representative of what's in the source material. Um, 
the people that are playing those characters are going to feel cheated, and then the people that aren't are, are just going to be way powerful, uh, way more powerful than they are. So I've tried to preserve all of the abilities that Tabaxi are known to have and or should have. The notable thing that did not make it into this list is the burst of speed trait um, that would you would you would be familiar with in 5th edition because they don't need it. A Tabaxi's base speed is 15. Now, that probably doesn't mean a lot to much of you, but when you get to the point where you're adding a dexterity bonus to that or you're adding a strength bonus to that, you could get up to 18 fairly quickly. 18 is the speed of a riding horse, okay? So I didn't believe at all that Tabaxi needed more maneuverability than that um, or, or more, you know, more movement than that. So I looked at other aspects of what they are and tried to bring those to the fore, right? So we see the racial bonuses to dark vision of 90 feet, um, imposing a negative two to also opponent surprise rolls. Yes, even elves. And being surprised only on a one on a D10. Detecting trap construction. This, uh, I think this came from first edition, but I thought it was, I thought it, I thought it was again representative, having a 90% just to detect traps around them that are mechanical or mundane in nature. You know, if you had a rock with the spell alarm cast on it, they, I mean, they wouldn't be able to detect that, right? Because there's no mechanism um, that's putting tension on the ground or, you know, different things like that, I guess. Um, so it's not the magical aspect, it's the mechanical aspect of traps that they can detect at 90% uh, ability, which is pretty awesome. Base speed 15, like you said, and then we, we move into uh, their, their natural attacks. So in second edition, you have what's called an attack routine. Um, an attack routine is different than an attack. A routine is a special thing, and only, there's only a few c uh, creatures that have one. In the case of tabaxi or something like a tiger or bear, Bears also have an attack routine. Uh, claw Claw Bite is one of the things that is pretty uh, universal. Um, you see it a lot in the in the Monstrous Manual for the creatures that have attack routines. So, what is a Claw Claw Bite? It does not work like multiple attacks, even though it is multiple attack rolls, and each roll benefits from an individual strength modifier. That's an important part. So on initiative, the tabaxi would be able to do claw claw bite with, with three, even if they only have one attack per round, that claw claw bite is what's called their attack routine. So they would get to do that one time. Um, they also have the, as you can see, the... Uh, the, bo the benefit of if both claws hit, then they automatically do a rear rake with both of their hind feet uh, for additional damage. Each one of those automatically hits, and it's not an additional attack roll, and each damage roll would apply the strength modifier separately. So that's just how, like, if you were to face a tabaxi uh, monster or non-player character, that's how you would resolve uh, its its attacks, right? Because that's straight out of the source material. I don't think it's right to deny a player character those things uh, because that's so central to what they are. You know, they're more cat than they are sapient, gentrified, you know, intelligent person. Um, so preserving those wild aspects of them, I think, is pretty critical. Uh, and as you can see, Tabaxi Lord, it's a, it's a step up in damage. Now, why would I agree to include those things? Well, they don't scale very well. So think about an elf, just a bone stock elf in the player's handbook that has 90% resistance to all sleep and charm spells, including auras and gaze attacks, right? So if, if it has the, uh, the keyword, even though I, I don't like that, uh, 
that way of representing it. But basically, if it's charm based, they just get 90% resistance to it no matter what, with no effort. No, they, you know, they don't have to evoke anything. They just get that. And, and there's a good reason for that uh, because of elven culture and their psyche. But that scales incredibly well because the higher you go up in character levels, the more magic is going to get thrown at the party and the, and the players themselves, right? So the more they're going to come in contact with things that would impose sleep or charm effects, and they can just waltz through that stuff. You know, oh, vampire? Gaze attack? Whatever? No, I don't think so, right? So um, being able to do a claw-claw bite attack routine, even if you consider the uh, additional damage they can do with the, if, if both paws hit, um, does not scale well. It, it would be powerful, sure, uh, in the beginning, like lower levels. But once you got you know, up to level 5, 6, you know, wizards are starting to pick up fireball and uh, other crazy stuff, like, no. Nah. Like, you know... <laughs> A, a single attack routine. Oh, and by the way, an attack routine always has to be directed against a single target. So they can't use three attacks at three separate things. They have to focus on a single target with all three. Um, there's only like a couple of creatures that that's not the case, but that they're spelled out in their own entries in the Monster's Manual. Tabaxi have to focus. So, you know, it, it does not scale well. Hell, look at Dark Elves. Look at Drow. You know, they get magic, just magic resistance, and it just keeps going up. <laughs> Talk about something that scales incredibly well. Um, so I, I didn't think this was outside the pale to allow a player to be able to utilize. And honestly, um, the I could. There's plenty of monsters that require a plus one magic uh, weapon or better to hit. Or just, you know, you have to hit it with magic and m normal mundane things will just not do any damage. Um, I could I could allow if a player, another player, cast Bless on a Tabaxi, that Tabaxi's natural weapons could count as a plus one magical modifier during the duration of the Bless spell. Um, but that's all, that's, that's all I would allow for that. Um, because there are plenty of creatures that require a plus two or better. There are some creatures that require a plus three or better magic item in order to even hit them, right? Um, so looking at the way it scales through the character levels, I think I'm fine with that. And I would encourage people to include that because, again, it's what's in the source material. Moving on... Um, we have their natural abilities like, or thief abilities. So if you, and these only come into play if you are going to play a thief class. Um, that's the way I would, I would game it, right? I wouldn't just give them access to these things because they're a tabaxi and like, oh, you just have a flat 10% or a flat 7%, even though you're not a thief, to move silently, hide in shadows and all that stuff. Because it comes down to, well, what are you practicing? Like, okay, if I'm a straight stick fighter, and that's what I'm practicing, well, I'm not practicing stealth. So you're not going to get better at those things. Um, you know, you can make the argument for, well, you know, just because of what they are, their natural form, um, they're better at those things. And, yeah, I would agree with that, and that is why... Um, I would also recommend that they begin play with the hunting non-weapon proficiency and the survival non-weapon proficiency, both at a plus two bonus. That, I believe, covers the bases when, it, when, when we're talking about stalking and hunting and stuff like that. There's no need to rope them in with the thief class uh, and start taking away some of the special, um, special qualities that thieves get, right? So if they are playing a thief, they get... A climb bonus at a times two movement speed all the time, be, just because hey, part cat, mostly cat climbs like a like a like a mamma jamma as we just saw recently. Um, move silently, hide in shadows, detect noise, pick locks. I'm I would assess a penalty because of their unique um, 
their their unique physiology, and then a read languages penalty again because they have they're in a new culture with no frame of reference for what they're looking at, right? Um, so there's where their natural abilities end, and now we get into class and level restrictions. So something that AD&D Second Edition has done and and had done quite a uh, quite a while before was look at the demi-human races and then impose class and level limit restrictions. Some people <clears throat> um, don't like that. I'm kind of in the middle. I, I absolutely understand why that's a thing, and I understand why it's also, in a way, needed so that you can still encourage human characters that don't get all these racial bonuses um, to enjoy the benefits that they get, right? So, and that one of those big ones is they can advance at any class, any level, unlimited, right? There's no limit to any level of any class that they can they can do. Look, looking at elves because I think elves are a good uh, race to kind of contrast the Tabaxi with because both elves and Tabaxi get a shit ton of just natural abilities, natural modifiers, and benefits. So kind of teeing off of that, elves cap out in their best classes at level 15. And I think fighters and thieves in, in a regular tabaxi would, would be appropriate at level 15. That's their, that's their cap. Clerics, tabaxi are very familiar with shamanism. Um, and that would likely carry over into, say, uh, you know, in a second or third or fourth generation tabaxi that was born in Faerun and, and not, you know, taken, <laughs> taken a slave on the island of Nexal. Um, I could definitely see them, you know, being a decent cleric, but um, that would not as good as if they were a fighter or a thief. So I felt the uh, limit of 12th level, uh, if they were a cleric, would apply. And then Tabaxi Lords are a completely different thing. Well, first off, let me let me roll it back. So we talked about in the Fires of Zatal adventure that that's the first mention we've seen of jaguar lords in uh, in in all of all of AD and D, right? Go, even going back to first edition, that the very first uh, entry had nothing about jaguar lords. But in a in a big way, with the information presented in the fires of Zatal, they are a very important part of Tabaxi um, culture, right? Well, when we met, went to the second edition um, Monstrous Manual, right, they actually renamed Jaguar Lords to Tabaxi Lords. And I think that was just a... Uh, I w that was just because when you flip to the page, because it's in alphabetical order, uh, when you flip to the page, um, you're looking at Tabaxi, and then you look at Jaguar Lord. The, you know, what do? Uh, so they just changed it to Tabaxi, Tabaxi Lord... To, uh, to fall in line with an alphabetical order and make that easier. I'm going to submit to you that a Jaguar Lord and a Tabaxi Lord could be different. And in my game, I would make them different. Um, I don't. I, Jaguar Lords are just different enough that they fall outside of the cosmology of Faerun and the Forgotten Realms. Um, they're just this huge, like... It's 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 a panther, but it's a panther way bigger than a natural panther would be, and it's intelligent. It's super level, you know. Not, it's not super. It's a, it's genius level intelligence, and it has spell like abilities. And oh by the way, it's really into human sacrifice. Um, <laughs> you know, need need I go on? Um, there, that's just outside of the cosmology of the realms of just it, it just doesn't work right it doesn't fit anywhere in um forgotten realm society especially if we're talking about bringing tabaxi into um the the society as a whole right across the entire realms and making them a contiguous living breathing part that works right so i would submit to you that a tabaxi lord is the walking on two legs version just like a tabaxi 
but they enjoy all the same benefits of the tabaxi lord or of the jaguar lord and so it it's not just a rename the tabaxi lord is a tabaxi but it's just this different kind of like proto tabaxi or some shit that um is just that much nastier the reason why i would i would submit that to you is because if you look at some of the major storylines in the forgotten realms in ad and d second edition you have the cult of the dragon and then you have the zen tarim and the black network right a tabaxi lord would fit perfectly as a lieutenant or an enforcer or the big bad or, or whatever um and there's a reason for for them to exist not only are the themes um, the themes are agreeable with like the human sacrifice, um, the vi worshiping Zaltec and violence and bloodshed and all that kind of stuff. Um, they would they would definitely agree with both of those groups, but um, it would it would just work better for them to be like a you know a normal Tabaxi um, as an analog for something like you know like. The Zentarim use dark elves and drow, you know, on the surface uh, occasionally. Well, Tabaxi could occupy that same role and just be the native uh, surface living force instead of the underdark dwelling force. So they could, you know, I look at the drow in that context uh, as an elite, you know, elite enforcers or elite troops or whatever that the Zentarim would use. Well, Tabaxi could occupy that same niche for them and keep them rare enough um, but be zaltec worshiping bloodthirsty types um, or just having you know a tabaxi lord doing his thing being a bad man right so that's how i would i would play with that to make it uh to make it jive better and i think that um, it would add more to the setting and to the lore of tabaxi if it was that way kind of went on a yarn but now let's go back to their levels if you look at the entry for jaguar lords or tabaxi lords they are a completely different animal uh no pun intended they get spell like abilities they get spell abilities uh and they ha they get access to magic some of the you know the rarest tabaxi lords and jaguar lords can cast spells as a seventh level wizard in addition to you know getting dimension door use etc etc um as they mature so um the the combinations of classes would be fighter cleric or fighter mage cleric and I don't see much variance beyond that. It's it's kind of their uh, their focus to not only to always be a cleric, right, of Zaltec, because they would be trained that way by their father. Um, tidbit of lore: every time a Tabaxi lord takes a mate and has a litter, um, it's only one child, and it's always another male tabaxi lord so there is it's it's a bloodline it's a, a cultural thing it's very symbolic uh and very tight-knit right so that's why you would have only fighter clerics or only fighter mage clerics in that role because they're it's almost you know at that point it's almost like a sith you know passing on you only one apprentice type thing right um so that's why I have uh, I've put that there, those level limits. Now, experience point penalties. If you've never played second edition, right, we're, we've just gone over all of these badass racial abilities and bonuses and stuff like that that a tabaxi would have and should have. Again, you, you don't want to put yourself in a situation where you're going to try and represent something but then not go by all of the things that are in the source material uh, just because it, the the people people would feel cheated if they were trying to play it and of course the players that were playing other races would just be way more powerful so <sighs> level limits or excuse me um experience point penalties the complete book of elves is a great um is a great example of how experience point penalties are used because it 
you know, takes you through all the different kinds of elf sub races and all the different cool things you can min max to your heart's content about them. But it also tells you the experience point penalty you have to um, you have to accept to benefit from all those abilities, right? And again, it just makes things more equitable across the table. So. I, when I look at all of these abilities, the things that scale, the things that don't scale, and all that kind of stuff, uh, I'm putting it at 20%, which is uh, on par with Drow. Okay, so if you look at the things that Drow has versus the things that Tabaxi has that I've presented here, I see it stacking up about the same. So that's a 20% experience point penalty that they have. That is... Uh, for one class. If they have additional classes, like if you did a fighter thief or a fighter cleric as a regular tabaxi, it's an additional 10% experience penalty per additional class. So you could end up with a 30% experience penalty if you're playing a fighter thief tabaxi. It gets worse for, <laughs> for tabaxi lords because that fighter mage cleric, that is a 40% experience penalty. And that really, it, it's a good forcing function. It's kind of arbitrary, right? But at the same time, it's also kind of a reality check so that, you know, people that see, you know, a player benefiting from all of these cool abilities, uh, there is a cost to that. You don't just get to be all things to all, you know, all all situations so that is um, that is a pretty important part of how balance was achieved and is achieved in second edition now if you have high scores I'm going to say it's 16 off the top of my head if you have a high score in your prime requisite abilities then you get to claw back no pun intended I'm, I'm, I'm a liar it was it was intentional <laughs> I, again, this is the second time. <laughs> this is the second time I've done this. Um, you get a claw back 10%, right? So if you have a 20% 20% experience point penalty because you're playing your Tabaxi, now that's reduced to a 10%. If if you're a Tabaxi fighter, I got a 16 strength. Cool. Now you have a 10% experience point penalty instead of a 20% because you got the bonus from having the high score in your prime requisite. That only holds true per class. So you don't get 10% um, bonus per class you meet. Um, so if, you know, in the in the case of a Tabaxi Lord, Fighter Mage Cleric, right, we're at a minus 40%. We're not going to mitigate 20% of that by having a high wisdom and a high strength or a high intelligence and a high wisdom or whatever for the mage cleric or fighter mage or whatever combination you want of prime requisite abilities you can only gain back 10 percent and you have to meet the prime requisite in each class you have to be eligible for that so you would have to have a 16 strength a 16 int and a 16 wisdom to be eligible for that 10% reduction in the penalty if you were a fighter mage cleric to Baxi Lord. Um, so it is it is a pretty ruthless um, way to achieve that balance, but it works very well in my humble opinion. Um, and it also is thematic. And that's a pretty important part, I would think. Because, hey, Tabaxi... In a, in a brand new environment, in a brand new culture, is going to be slower at picking things up, etc., etc., etc. So, man, now let's go and talk about their culture. So we talked about they worship Zaltek, and that uh, that is the only deity mentioned in the second edition Monstrous Manual, or, uh, well, actually, and in the Fires of Zatal Adventure, we actually get to see them worshiping more deities, right? Um, which I'm, I'm going to go over. That's why we're talking about it. I, I'm sorry. Uh, here we go. So, Zaltek. That is predominantly when a Tabaxi Lord takes over a Tabaxi clan. He forces them to worship Zaltek, and that's the end of it. 
usually they worship um, Tezka, which is the god of fire or the god of the sun, or they worship Nula, which is the goddess of animals, or rarely they would worship Azul, which is the god of water and rain. So, all of you 5th edition boyos and girlies out there, the cat lord crap that they have for 5th edition is is basically a bald-faced plagiarism of Elder Scrolls vis-a-vis -vis Akatosh the cat lord, right? Um, it, it is, there's no reason for them to say, oh yeah, the, the, the cat lord, or no, Akatosh the great cat, I want to say. Uh, but yeah, there's no reason that they needed to say the cat lord anything, because, like, they have, the, they already wrote the lore, <laughs> you know? Um, but that's what it is. It's the god of fire, the god of the sun, the goddess of animals, or rarely, Azul, the god of water and rain. Um, so that's, the holistic look at what they, uh, at what Tabaxi, what resonated with them spiritually. I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tear. Tabaxi are not Khajiit. And in, in a big way, we see that because they do not like trading at all. And I thought about this, and I think I have the reason why. Predators are very self reliant. And that individualism, that ability to provide for themselves, is super important. If you're a predator and you can't hunt, well, you're not, a, you're not really a predator. So the ability to be able to work for the thing that you have and do it yourself is a big deal to Tabaxi. Let's say if we were going to trade, I, regardless of how much resources I have to trade for the thing that I'm trading for. What happens if the person I would conduct the trade with isn't there? Well, then I don't get the thing I want. Well, what happens if the person that I'm conducting trade with runs out of what I'm trying to acquire? Well, then I don't get what I want. So what happens is that now you are in a position of dependence on this other person to get the thing you want. And that is, for a tabaxi, I, at like a biological level, completely against what they are as a predator. Because they need to be able to... And we're back. Oh man, <laughs> I wish, I wish we did this on the the first take. But anyway, so if if you're trading with a Tabaxi, it's putting them in a position of being dependent upon the trade to get the thing they're after, where their entire biology and culture is telling them that they need to be self-sufficient. Um, and that's why I think trading just doesn't work for them. Gifts, on the other hand, are a completely different story. If you're a predator and you're so successful that not only are you self-reliant and self-sufficient, you can provide for somebody else. Like That is an incredibly symbolic statement and a very powerful statement among predators. And you typically see that in, uh, in mating, right? in choosing a mate where, like, hey, I got this kill. I'm going to give it to you. Mm, num, num, num. Tastes good, right? Here's another one. I do this shit all day. Um, being able to do that as a predator is, 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 a, is a heck of a statement, right? Um, and, and again, for mating, that would be where it, it makes most sense and has the most symbolism. But that, I think, is why you know, Tabaxi would be fine with gifts, but not want trading at all. The other thing, um, they're not nomadic. Then they would not be a nomadic people because they live in a jungle, right? There is no change of seasons that forces them to move. 
uh, and there's no change of seasons that would force game or food sources to move out of their area. If anything, they have additional food sources moving into their area at certain times of the year, um, and there's no weather patterns, you know, that would that would threaten them or force them to move. So they they would not be nomadic at all. Um, so there's my piece on that. Now, where would they be? Where do you where do you plop Tabaxi down into a Forgotten Realms campaign setting? We know the nation of Omn are the ones that settled the island of Nexal um, and are actually are, are the ones that interacted with Tabaxi first. Um, you know, there are tribal human uh, cultures on the island of Nexal that certainly predated, you know, they, they met the Tabaxi first. But as it pertains to Faerun and the uh, Forgotten Realms proper, the nation of Am are really the ones that imported Tabaxi in the first place. So if you were going to plop them down in your campaign setting, it makes the most sense to me that one of the first places they would congregate is would be in very large cities, and I'm thinking Waterdeep. Um, I could totally see an alley or two that were just completely overtaken by Tabaxi, right? Uh, they might have a shop or a couple of shops at like the very first part of the street, but the further you go back, it's just all homes and all owned by t the same clan of Tabaxi that keep to themselves and you know have their own little warren and stuff like that. Uh, because it, it makes sense when you look at um, the fact that they tended to avoid contact with people, they tended to avoid contact with other clans of Tabaxi. So that would be a, a good place for a player character to start from. Or a very, very rural... Um, sort of combine or commune um, or co-op, if you will, where you know they have several families living together in a clan-like setting, and where that I think makes the most sense, believe it or not, would be in Cormanthir Forest, right? So the young elves of Cormanthir that are resisting the uh, retreat would probably look at the Tabaxi as a displaced people. Um, and be quick allies, right? Because the elves need more people in their forest to defend their forest, and the tabaxi need a nice wide open place that they can have, you know, own and be theirs and, and exist and propagate in, right? So I just think that those two would be very fast allies, and I think there's enough space between the paragraphs, so to speak, where you could have Tabaxi occupying the Cormanthir forest and working with the elves, and you know nobody be any the wiser. It would it would work just fine in in the campaign setting. Man, we covered a lot of ground. Um, again, I wish I would have done this in the first take, but that's what I got for you. I hope you consider making Tabaxi's part of your second edition world and part of your second edition uh, player character races. I got nothing else for you. I'm throwing down the peace sign and I will see you next time.